This is the fifth anniversary of the flattening of the Earth. The Earth used to be a chubby rotating sphere falling in a dark universe. It touched the abstract ground and for some time it flattened. I've worked as a scientist till the announcement. Now it's pure observation. We can't form anything new. Physics stop working on Earth. We can't experiment and communicate. We've almost lost numbers, languages. Writing from the border of the Earth, the only place where we can still observe. Maybe we live in a kind of experiment, on a flat part of a semispheric planet. is the same as before, but the other side is impossible to reach. We lost gravitational force when we turned flat. We perceive other forces somehow. our world there's a barrier, a bubble that blocks all movement. The semispheric part of our planet could be a parallel version of our world, one that hasn't become flat. So there would be everything that is here, included me doing this research. But in, let's say, spherical version, there was a split of the forms. Others say that when our planet turned flat, all continents, oceans, and all the matter was sucked up to the top, forming this flat cap. So there wouldn't be anything on the other part. It's the base for the flat plate of the world. It was a flattening, leveling, simplification, horizontalization. Territory has remained intact, as we've always remembered it. But the edge of the earth was formed. The edge did not exist before. As on this sphere, there are no edges. Do you remember? This border creates a limit between our own flat surface, semi-spherical one, impossible to reach, 
It was formed with terrestrial flattening. On one side, the belt blocks the terrestrial waters from falling in the space of the universe. There is only one opening, the Great Rainbow Canal. The sea level began to lower, slowly, until the flap was discovered, the crack in the edge of the belt. We managed to control its flow with a system of channels and dumps, and now it can be used to keep the sea level constant. of the earth is the only place that still can generate images. I'm standing on the border of the earth now. I've started to perceive some changes in my own body and mind. I transformed. My tongue, my language has changed since I'm here. I can see the great rainbow canal right in front of me. at a distance which I can measure. I see the water falling right through the only opening in a bell of mountains that surrounds the edge of the earth. The amount of water is impressive, as I've never seen anything like this before, never even visualized it. The water falling into the space of the universe creates specific phenomena that can be compared to the effect of a rainbow. It's something between the rainbow and the aurora borealis. Some people say it's an infinite fire that came back to us as we've gone back in time as we reached a point in our history and then just started again The Great Rainbow Canal is our only connection with what's outside of the flat earth. I believe that the water that falls from our flat surface is coming down to the opposite and semispherical part of the planet in form of a waterfall. A kind of a continuous rainbow rain.
the time has changed since the flattening. I start to remember now that we used to feel for a long time. We used to have the same personal emotion for since the sunrise until it came down. We don't have this anymore. We feel in a group who we'll constantly change. As there is a constant change of emotion, we're synchronized. This place is like a membrane. It absorbs and then it lets go. There is, there's nothing that can reflect here. I, I, I cannot see my own image and see new images made of all the things. I have seen them come in all together as if there was a grain were pulled somewhere as if everything was then slowly vanishing into this huge mass of water coming down. I have never believed in magic, nor I believed in something. There is no more science to believe in. I, I just watch and observe and interpret. I barely remember that maybe this is how it was for centuries and thousands of years, or maybe this is how it has never been. You think that clearly a plane evolves into a sphere. Simple things slowly become more complex, but can you observe exactly this right now? The canal, the rainbow, it's like it's been this kind of a flow, a purifying flow of something, all the strange mixtures, all the things we've accumulated in those centuries, it's been enough. We've reached a certain point of immateriality that was probably beyond every limit. That's why the ground was cut from under. We became again, living on a plate that so we can feel. In 
those moments I also saw the earth from afar Like a shady marble Ball of water and gas But now there is nothing behind that horizon For what had been to imagine The sharpness and the mystery of being Constantly in a movement Thank you. Um, thanks so much, Joel, for organizing this. Great. Um, so t the title of my talk today, as you can see, is um, Transforming Ideas of Earth, Burgeoning Ideas of Extinction, Revolutioning Ide Revolutionizing Ideas of Intelligence. Uh, so just to begin, um, yeah, I think I wanted to um, try and um, extrude this talk from the themes of uh, Natalia's film um, and I particularly love uh, the idea in the film of um, this radical sudden shift to the earth and our perceptions of it. Um, I think it's a really brilliant idea um, and so it made me think of places I could think of in fiction where um, similar ideas are explored. Um, I thought initially of uh, Ballard's The Drowned World um, where, um, an expanding sun, I believe, um, makes the earth warm up and it tells the story of how people, this external change to the planet, um, people cope with it, with internal changes to their psychology, less known. And I think maybe more interesting is the mysterious force by J. H. Rosny, the elder French science fiction author, uh, early 1900s. Um, in this story, uh, some aliens, um, extraterrestrials meddle. Um, with physics and eliminate a portion of the um, color spectrum, the light spectrum, um, which by uh, tampering with infrared causes the earth to cool and uh, creates a global catastrophe. Um, so these are similar ideas. I, something about the theme I find very interesting. Um, but relating this to my own work, um, I'm a historian of ideas. Um, I study intellectual history. Um, and it occurred to me that um, Though obviously not physically or literally, um, the history of ideas is interested in the ways that apprehensions of the world, um, beliefs about it, uh, have undergone transformations, revolutions in the past, and how this has drastically altered our sense of our position and our priorities within that world. Um, so yeah, basically, I mean, this is the way I see 
um, these things. And this is what I'm interested in is how across the past changing and expanding our sense of what is uh, has changed and expanded our sense of what ought um, alongside how best to live up to this. Um, so yeah, without further ado, today I want to explore um, three major transformations in our sense of the earth and our species and our place within it. First, uh, how unique the earth's history um, as a planet that has developed life might be within the wider cosmos. Um, second, where we as Homo sapiens might be positioned within that wider earthly history. Um, and third, uh, what the rest of the history and diversity of other life on Earth can tell us about our peculiar, precarious endowment of technological intelligence. So to start off with the first transformation, how unique is Earth's history? Um, so to begin with, it would help to establish what I mean by unique here. So um, based on the view of 21st century science, most of the cosmos appears abiotic, meaning inorganic or unliving in both space and time. Uh, but Earth is the one place we know of where something historically novel has happened relative to this unliving past and backdrop. That is, life has emerged and taken hold. And what makes this special? Um, biology somewhat uniquely exhibits a history in a genuinely meaningful sense. Um, its present depends upon its past and its future depends on its present, uh, meaning that forms can appear that have never appeared before and forms can disappear never to return. The history of life appears to not repeat itself. Indeed, once biological forms are lost, uh, they are lost from the entire cosmos uh, forever, uh, irreversibly. Um, so species are precarious and precious precisely because they are through and through historical entities, historically fragile and historically unique, produced by chains of unrepeatable occurrence. In doubt, indeed, we uh, now all recognize, no matter how implicitly, that the Earth species are a product of its history in a special and strong sense. This evolutionary story that has taken place on Earth uh, and the organic products wrought by it uh, would be extremely unlikely to recur elsewhere, elsewhere. And with this comes the recognition that Earth-born life as a familial whole, sharing one common origination in time and space, um, can persist into the future for meaningfully longer or shorter durations. Um, in other words, once life is gone, it is gone, which means that persistence becomes meaningful, survival becomes meaningful from the perspective of the wider universe. That's all just a fancy way of saying there is one Earth with one shared past and one shared future. Um, however, I argue uh, that for most of human history, this just wasn't possible to recognize. Um, the facts and the uh, scientific discoveries were not there yet. Uh, so ancient peoples, broadly and invariably speaking, didn't realize that in dying out, species forever lose the potential to ever exist again. Um, thus, they didn't realize that species could go extinct in the sense that we now recognize. Um, they thought the species could be wiped out from some region or even from all of Earth, but in the eternities of time and space, the species would return somewhere or somewhere else um, in time. Um, species cannot lose the potential to exist. There was therefore no acknowledgement that species are historical entities, which are historically fragile, dependent for their present existence on uninterrupted chains of descent uh, backward descent and reliant for their continued survival on uninterrupted chains of forward succession. No acknowledgement that species are thus unique to the earth and its unique history such that if they die out here, they die out everywhere forever. Um, and so zooming in on ancient Greece, um, for thinkers, philosophers there like Plato and Aristotle, for example, um, there was a very cyclical notion of time and history and quite a limited one in terms of its possibility space. Um, they broadly thought that in the measureless past, everything achievable had already been achieved here on Earth. Uh, and in the measureless future, everything lost will later be returned here on Earth. Nothing can be lost, nothing gained. Um, and for those 
pre-modern thinkers who believed in plural worlds. Uh, similar idea that um, the entire space of historical possibility was always concurrently exhaustively manifested um, as actual uh, across all other worlds throughout the cosmos. Uh, this idea was common. Um, what's more, the space of historical possibility was not recognized to go far beyond what was currently observably actual um, on their doorsteps here on Earth. Um, so this idea cashed out is this, I this presumption that all worlds throughout the cosmos exhibit to varying degrees a history identical to Earth's. Just to put this into relief, here's a quote from the Roman philosopher Lucretius. He said quite confidently, in all other parts of the universe, there are other worlds inhabited by many different peoples and species. Uh, note the use of peoples there. Um, and so here's the ancient Greek worldview. What of the Abrahamic worldview, the Christian, Judaic, um, Islamic worldview? Uh, to zoom in on medieval Christendom, um, here's some illustrations of the Ptolemaic worldview. This was the cosmology um, broadly accepted um, throughout uh, the Christian world in the medieval uh, era. Um, I use this image uh, to illustrate how um, there is no region of this uh, cosmos that isn't thought of as populated. Um, you see the outer sphere, um, that's heaven, it's filled with angels and God in the throne at the top. Um, and this idea that the whole of the cosmos is kind of populated by um, ethical agencies, beneficiaries, sufferers, um, uh, in space, also applied in time. Um, that is to say, uh, here, life and spirit governs cosmology and natural history. There is no distinction between ethics and physics. To the extent that the physical universe even has a history, uh, it is not separate or separable from ethical design and decree, mainly God's ethical design and decree. So that is all to say, um, for both ancient Greeks and medieval Christendom, um, there was simply no awareness that vast regions in both time and space could be or had been abiotic or unpopulated. No awareness that both life and intelligence emerge from and can disappear within a wider physical history that outstrips and can exist without life and mind. Uh, instead, invariably, mind and life were thought to dictate and govern natural history as a whole. Life and mind were not recognized as historical variables within physical history, capable of emergence and termination and longer and shorter periods of duration. So, um, again, really broad brush uh, explorations of this history. Um, we might ask what happened after modern science's Copernican revolution. Um, this was the, um, the uh, discovery um, through the invention of telescopes that um, the cosmos is much larger, the Earth isn't at the center, um, and the other stars appear to be other suns, which seem to make, which presumably have other planets around them. Um, you might think that this might have decentered and disrupted these old views um, and injected kind of historicity into wider nature. Um, revealing life as emerging within and capable of dis disappearing from this wider cosmic backdrop. Um, and you might think this because one of the major first discoveries of uh, this new science, this new astronomy, um, was that suns are in some sense perishable. So here is a picture of um, an illustration of sunspots. Um, Galileo and his peers were interested in these. Um, and Whereas the old worldview, the Aristotelian um, and the Ptolemaic worldview, thought that the heavens were incorruptible, um, that is, incapable of being uh, undergoing destruction, uh, this discovery of sunspots um, implied that the suns themselves were perishable. So this might make you think that if a sun can die, then surely people would have to acknowledge that um, life uh, and the life of entire planets is subsumed within his this wider history in the sense that it can go extinct. However, uh, no, the old view, the old um, worldview uh, persisted in various ways. Um, so uh, here's a quote from Bernard Fontenelle, a French writer. Um, he says uh, that for some ancient stars that disappear, other new ones are born in their places, and that defect in nature must be so repaired and no species can totally perish. 
Um, so what he's saying here is that sons might die, sure, but um, another one will appear elsewhere to take its place and it will have planets around it that will be repopulated by the same species. Um, again, this idea that species might die from a certain region, but their potential to exist cannot disappear such that they will appear somewhere else in the vastness of time and space. Similar comments here from another French writer, Benoit de Mallet, in the 1720s. He said quite explicitly, whatever may be the fate of this earth and its inhabitants, there are reason to believe that in the great multitude of globes contained in space, there will always be other terrestrial globes beside ours, which are inhabited by as many generation of men and animals. So again, this assumption that not just that the whole of space is populated by life, but it's populated by men, uh, humans and animals. De Malak goes on and says, when species or civilizations disappear in one globe, they reappear in another. If a sun is extinguished, it is re replaced by another. If a globe like ours is set on fire and all its living creatures destroyed, new generations will replace them on another globe. He concludes, the endless species of animals shall always exist, will subsist forever, even in the cosmic vicissitudes that seem to destroy them. So here is quite a strong statement that extinction is actually just impossible. Um, and this led to a certain attitude towards the destruction of entire planets. Um, here's Kant uh, in the 1750s writing, we ought not lament the perishing of a world as a real loss of nature. Let us then regard such terrible catastrophes even with a sort of complacency. This leads to an attitude that I call cosmic nonchalance, um, which is this assumption that Earth's destruction wouldn't matter uh, because humanoids exist or will return everywhere and forever. Um, Earth's history here and now uh, and us as products of it cannot be fragile because it isn't unique and it re repeats and recurs. So just to show the persistence of this idea into, um, you know, periods of time that we might recognize as more proximate to us than uh, someone writing in the 1600s or 1700s, um, here's Hans Christian Orsted, 1852, uh, saying exactly the same thing, uh, quote, the same fundamental idea of the globe and of man must be repeated in each solar system. However, awareness of the size and depth of our own planet's history and our placement within it was destabilizing this confidence that all other planets would concurrently be populated with humanoids or flourishing civilizations like our own. Here's a nice quote from uh, Simon Newcomb, uh, an astronomer from 1879. And he reasons that um, Earth has probably been revolving in its orbit 10 millions of years. Man has probably existed on it less than 10,000 years. Civilization less than 4,000. Telescopes little more than 200. Had an angel visited it at intervals of 10,000 years to seek for thinking beings, he would have been rather disappointed a thousand times or more. Reasoning from analogy, we are led to believe that the same disappointments might await him who would now travel from planet to planet and from system to system on a similar search until he examined many thousand planets. So this idea that our own planet has a history and humans, uh, life itself, let alone civilization has not populated that entire history uh, was now being extrapolated into the wider cosmos. Uh, making people realize that this assumption that all planets are populated might not, might not be sound. And so this idea was coming from a new awareness of um, our species and civilization's own placement within our Earth's wider history. So this moves to the second transformation um, that I wanted to talk about, which is our placement within Earth's history. So to touch a bit upon what I was talking about earlier, most prior generations um, assumed, broadly speaking, uh, that they lived nearer the end of time than its beginning, um, or that human history couldn't end and would continue in variations on the present, interrupted or not, everlastingly. Um, now, however, um, there's a sense that the future is capacious, but also precarious. Um, that is that there could be many future generations or none dependent upon what happens now, uh, the actions of the current generation. Um, so how did we get here? 
Uh, well, first, I want to give some examples of these two broad prior um, ideas, assumptions I spoke about. Um, so first, this idea that uh, uh, we can't really say where we are in history because history doesn't really have a beginning or an ending. Um, we live in an internal, unchanging present. Um, this is, as I was uh, gesturing to earlier, um, a broad assumption in ancient Greece. Um, here's Aristotle. He says, uh, probably each art and science has often been developed as far as possible and has again perished, not once nor twice nor occasionally, but infinitely often. Uh, and within the multitude of years, everything has been found out. All possible achievements and discoveries are within the experience of ages. Inquiry is thus attempting to supply defects in recall and doing good is just returning to the peaks of the past. Um, so this idea that you know, everything achievable has already been achieved. And if we lose something now or destroy a species or lose some good achievement, it will be returned such that there is no real placement within a wider meaningful history. He even went on to say that because of this, we can't really say where we are in history. We can't even say what it would mean to be prior or posterior. He says, in what sense must we understand the terms prior and posterior? If then human life is a circle and a circle has neither beginning nor end, we should not be prior to those who lived before us, nor they prior to us by being nearer to the beginning. And he even goes on to say that depending on the interval of repetition, we may even be more properly prior to them, uh, which is rather mind bending. Um, so to give an example of uh, this um, other view, this other assumption that we're probably living closer to the end of time, um, this was the broad assumption, um, again, as I said, throughout Christianity um, and other Abrahamic religions. Um, and so here's a quote from Thomas Brown uh, from the 1600s, a very devout religious uh, man. He said, uh, "'Tis too late to be ambitious, the great mutations of the world acted, or time may be too short for our designs." Um, so I point to these two different assumptions because I do see them as coloring uh, the broad options throughout most of uh, history in the West, particularly. Um, so on the one hand, you have this eternalistic cyclical view, wherein we can't say that we really have a placement within history in a meaningful sense, because it's all happened before and it will happen again. Or alternately, um, the uh, Abrahamic um, uh, worldview leads to this assumption that uh, sure, there is a history, but we're just way closer to the end than the beginning and everything uh, will end soon. Uh, and the past is even not that long at uh, anyway. So these two rather shallow senses of history. However, uh, from the 1600s onwards, um, geology had started to consolidate as a serious science. Um, and these these earth sciences uh, by going on to theorize that the habitability of the planet um, had a definite beginning and will have a definite end eventually allowed people to orient themselves within earth's wider history um that the habitability of earth and life itself is not eternal such that we can think of it having a future different from its past um but also that its past and future are far off in deep time rather than proximate or imminent um so this new view um, allowed a nesting of human history within this wider physical canvas, and it reorganized humanity's sense of its own potentials and prospects. So this begins even as early as uh, 16, uh, the mid 1600s. Um, Nicholas Steno, one of the first uh, major modern thinkers in geology, um, was pointing out that the evidence of the strata implies that there was a time on Earth before life had emerged. Um, so there was this clear beginning, this clear beginning point um, within the history of the wider planet. Now, this led to a slow dawning recognition that life and mind emerge within wider physical nature as a historical product uh, that can therefore persist, persist for longer or shorter periods. It's contingent and variable rather than imperishable inevitability baked into nature from the beginning. Um, and so here in the 1770s, you get the first attempt to actually put a quantitative estimate upon uh, the size of the habitable past and also the size of the habitable future on our planet. Um, these come from the French naturalist Georges Buffon, 
who heated uh, some small iron globes and measured their cool down times and then extrapolated that to the size of the earth to arrive at these estimates. You know, a very rudimentary um, method and, and of course wrong, but at least he was trying and he was the first to try. So he put out this number of uh, 93,000 years until, as he said, all living matter becomes a corpse and all organized substance is reduced to raw matter. Um, so this was uh, you know, the first quantitative estimate on Earth's future habitability. And this led people to therefore think of humanity and humanity's history, civilization, life itself more broadly, as being a product of Earth's history, as emerging within it and being, uh, being destroyed by it as well. So here's Henri Saint-Simon from 1813 saying, uh, the existence of the human species is linked to that of the planet. It is directly dependent on it. Uh, geologists agree the earth was for a long time uninhabitable for humans as well as for all other terrestrial animals. And by corollary, at some future time, it will be uninhabitable again and the human species will die out. Now, and this is important, uh, is that by putting a clear backward stop on past habitable time, this meant that it became much more plausible to suggest over and above the cyclical view of Aristotle that we were pointing to earlier, it became much more plausible to suggest that everything humanly achievable has not yet been achieved here on earth at least, which was requisite, the requisite physical backdrop for emerging theories of social progress. Here's uh, Marquis de Condorcet, um, from 1794, saying that the progress of civilization has no other limit than the duration of the globe upon which nature has placed us. And so long as there are no changes, as would no longer permit the human species to persevere. Now, we might now see this as just a massively optimistic uh, statement of enlightenment progressivism, which it is. But what's important and more interesting here is that Condorcet is actually just saying that this progress must happen within a physical history that outstrips and supersedes anything within that human history. And that's what's important here. So how much time was left? Um, so Buffon had given his estimate of nine, uh, 90,000 years of future on Earth. Uh, this was soon updated. Uh, in the 1850s, uh, thermodynamics emerges, um, which allows physicists to theorize that the sun produces heat by gravitationally collapsing on itself. Um, and this allows them to make predictions about how long, how much further sunlight there is, how much further um, future on Earth there is. So the first prediction from William Thompson uh, in 1854 um, uh, and he estimated that the, there would be sun, uh, that sunlight cannot last as at present for 300,000 years. Uh, by the end of the 1800s, uh, physicists had converged on very low tens of millions for their estimates of Earth's habitable future. Uh, we see some examples here. Um, so, you know, this had moved from upwards from Kelvin's uh, 300,000 and it had moved a lot upwards from Buffon's much earlier 90,000 years. Um, you know, 10 million years of future might seem like a very uh, long time. Um, however, uh, in the intervening time, um, the sense of life's unexplored potentials had grown, um, be mainly because of uh, the um, emergence of um, uh, Darwin's theories. Um, and also people believed that the ratio of past uh, spent to future ahead was rather unforgiving. Um, Here's a quote from Robert Ball, who said that it seems that the sun has already dissipated about four fifths of the energy with which it may have originally been endowed. So this sense that uh, there just wasn't that much time ahead relative to what was in the past. Um, this proved depressing um, because there was this idea that evolution had come thus far, but didn't have time to go much farther. So here's a quote from a si this similar time period. Um, Bringing uh, all the aeons spent, bringing us up to the present point, and no sufficient time remains to avoid all the possibilities of our actual state. This is sad indeed. Waste, sheer waste on the most gigantic scale. And so as the 1800s closed, there was a sense of, uh, a new sense of, you know, humanity's placement within uh, wider physical history, but a pessimism regarding how much future was ahead. However, as the 1900s opened, um, a new phenomenon of nature, radioactivity, was discovered, which changed everything. Um, here's a picture of Marie Curie, who uh, facilitated this entire discovery. Um, 
And the interesting thing about radioactivity was it revealed this new and completely uh, previously unimagined energy source within nature. Um, here's uh, scientist William Crookes, um, probably being quite sensational, but saying one gram of radium would be enough to blow the British Navy sky high. Uh, the press instantly picked up on this, and um, there was a period of what people call radio mania uh, when uh, the wider public was rather obsessed with this phenomenon. Um, but the interesting thing with uh, the discovery of radioactivity wasn't just the amount of energy, it was also that these radio elements decay on a time scale, which was absolutely gigantic. Um, almost immediately, a clock was made powered by a pinch of radium, which was calculated to be able to run for 20,000 years. Um, people soon worked out that the actual time scales of decay were in the billions um, and even larger. Um, and so what was important about this was this new uh, force of nature could be postulated as powering the sun, um, allowing it to go forwards for much longer than previously acknowledged. Um, almost immediately, people started saying that uh, the sun might be powered by radioactivity and the future must, might be way larger than people had previously speculated or estimated. Uh, here's George Darwin, Charles Darwin's son, saying, Given the discovery of this new power source, I see no reason for doubting the possibility of augmenting the estimate of solar heat by some such factor as 10 or 20. So what's important here was, as this quote uh, makes clear, that the discovery of this new form of energy has extended indefinitely the backward and forward sweep of cos the cosmical timetable, as people said at the time. So the future was booming, it was growing massively. Uh, by 1920, the physicist Arthur Eddington was predicting 15 billion years of further sunlight. Uh, by 1928, the cosmologist James Jeans was forecasting a trillion further years. Um, he got this wrong, I must add. It was slashed to 10 billion in the 1940s and again in the 1960s to 5 billion years of future sunlight. However, what's important is this gives some sense of how drastically time scales were expanding during this period in the 1910s and 20s. Communicating this to the wider public in 1929, Jeans uh, visualized a stamp atop a penny balanced upon a 20 meter high obelisk. Uh, the stamp's thickness, he said, represented the 5,000 years or so of recorded history. The stamp and the penny combined represented our species existence. And the distance from the stamp down to the base of the obelisk being the age of the past age of the earth. Uh, here's a picture of the obelisk that Jeans was visualizing um to give some sense of the scale and so genes continued in order to try and give a sense of how large the upper bound on the, this new prolonged future is he said now stick another postage stamp on top of the first to represent the next five thousand years of civilization and keep sticking on postage stamps until you have a pile as high as mont blanc even now the pile forms an inadequate representation of the length of the future which so far as astronomy can see probably stretches before humanity unless an accident cuts it short the first postage stamp represents what humanity has already achieved the pile which outtops mont blanc represents what it may achieve here's a painting of mont blanc again to give some sense of scale so this led people to conclude that well there was just a massive reversal of the sense of where we were in time from previous generations uh, thinking that they lived near the the end of the world in the sense of either apocalypse or the fact that the sun just simply didn't have that much energy left in it people now thought that life on earth and humanity within it might be existing somewhat near the beginning of time and so genes concluded um in rather evocative terms i think he said we are creatures of the dawn with unimaginable opportunities for accomplishment and unexplored potentialities ahead. So there was this new optimism. However, this optimism wasn't just uh, entirely naive and um, uh, not sensitive to contingency and accident. Here's uh, the um, brilliant American geologist, Thomas Chamberlain from 1903, um, reflecting on this new uh, prolonged protracted future. He said, we have grown up in the belief that the earth sprung from chaos at the opening of our era and is plunging on to catastrophe or to a final winter in the near future. Quite at variance with this, earth offers a fair prospect of fitness for habitation for ages yet to come. 
If this be true, it is eminently fitting that humanity should give a due measure of thought to the ulterior effects of its actions. These considerations especially intensify the problem of those resources on which our civilization so profoundly depends. So this sense that there's now this um, massively extended future means that there's more potential to uh, do good within that time, but also more potential to do damage now that might foreclose those potentials for good. And what's important um, and interesting is that Chamberlain was one of the first uh, scientists to suggest that CO2 might cause global warming, that human activity might be um, causing uh, negative effects on the planetary climate, and that therefore this puts an obligation on the present generations um, in order that they don't um, damage uh, the prospects of all of the future generations. So he was a very prescient thinker. Um, so again, these thinkers, even if they were very optimistic about this large future, were still sensitive to the fact that it could be cut short. Um, so here's Jean saying, accident may replace our Mont Blanc of postage stamps by a truncated column of only a fraction. Chamberlain similarly said that Earth may be congenial to life for tens of millions of years to come, but congeniality of conditions does not ensure actual realization. Protracted habitability does not necessarily carry the actual realization of the future opportunities thus open to our species, he said. Indeed, almost immediately, uh, given this new birth of nuclear physics, uh, there were fears that tampering with atoms could destroy humanity and the world. People thought that unlocking the power of the atom might lead to an unstoppable chain reaction explosion that would blow up the Earth. But also this new uh, discovery of radioactivity revealed more, revealed more hopeful prospects. Um, Robert Goddard, the American um, rocketry pioneer, writing in 1918, said, Will it be possible to travel to the planets around other stars when the sun and the earth have cooled to such an extent that life is no longer possible on earth? He answered, yes, if it is possible to unlock and control intra-atomic energy. So this new sense of a enlarged future, um, but also a precarious one, um, all gated upon this new discovery of radioactivity, this new sense that humanity and life could be at the beginning of its history and that there are even these potentials, as uh, pointed out by Goddard, of um, decoupling the history of life from the fate of our sun and extending it into astronomical um, uh, catchments. So to close, the final uh, transformation that I want to look at is um, this question of the inevitability. What is the historical inevitability of intelligence or um, as I put it here, would intelligence get another chance if we, aka humanity, fails? So, um, given all of these discoveries that we've been exploring up till now, um, there was this new sense uh, around the early 1900s that technological intelligence might be a novel product on Earth, emerging from an unintelligent past with a long prospect ahead within which to explore its unexplored potentialities. But to return to what we were talking about in the first section, what of those other planets elsewhere? Does the same history play out there? This leads naturally to another question. If intelligence is common elsewhere, and one of its potentialities is unlocking atoms and spilling outward into deep space, then why isn't ET already here? This uh, outlandish but fascinating question uh, was beginning to be asked in the 1940s against the backdrop of the burgeoning space age. So as an example, here's the uh, paleontologist uh, Tahad de Chardin in 1945, um, a speech he gave in Beijing, uh, asking this question. He said, if journeying between celestial bodies were practicable, it is hard to see why we ourselves have not already been invaded. Similar, a lot of intellectuals started asking this question around this time. Uh, here's the American anthropologist, Lauren Isley. Um, he said, since we now talk endlessly of space rockets, it is not, no surprise that this thinking yields the obverse of the coin, that the rocket or its equivalent may have come first to us from somewhere outside. Surely in the infinite wastes of time in the lapse of suns and wane of systems, the passage, if it were possible, would have been achieved, but the bright projectile has not been found. Indeed, 
since the 1930s, growing cosmological evidence of um, the receding galaxies um, had, grown, had been growing to imply that the whole observable universe itself also may have had a definitive beginning. As earlier with geology giving our own planet a definitive beginning, this new cosmology implied a backstop on past time for the whole cosmos, within which life across the whole observable universe may not have already achieved everything it is possible for it to achieve. Perhaps then it becomes possible to suggest that we are just among the very first technological intelligences to evolve. And this is exactly how Isley answered his own question. He said, moreover, the present theory of the expanding universe has made time as we know it no longer infinite. If the entire universe was created in a single explosive instant a few billion years ago, there has not been a sufficient period for all things to occur, even behind the star shoals of the outer galaxies. In the light of this fact, it is now just conceivable that there may be nowhere in space a mind superior to our own. However, one residual form of cosmic nonchalance uh, remained, and this is the conviction that if humanity extinguished itself on Earth here and now, some ad other animal, perhaps one of our fellow mammals, we would evolve to take our place, becoming bipedal and technological. Some have uh, rather charmingly called this the planet of the apes hypothesis. It goes all the way back to Darwin in 1860 in a letter he speculated, if every vertebrate were destroyed throughout the world except the now, our now established reptiles, millions of ages might elapse before reptiles could become highly developed on a scale to mammal, equal to mammals and possibly more intellectual. Beginning with Darwin, this speculation trickles throughout uh, the history of evolutionary scientists. Uh, here's the paleontologist William Dillon Matthew in 1928, speculating and conjecturing a similar hypothesis. He thought that if there was a mass extinction, uh, as he said, life would commence, recommence its slow upward climb with the leisurely steps of progress from such higher stages as survived. And he speculated that Quote, in the far distant ages to come, the future destiny of the world might be committed into the hands of some super intelligent dog or bear or glorified weasel. Um, and even the lizards might rebuild the age of the reptiles, evolving into progressively higher intelligent animals. Um, just to show the persistence of this rather strange line of thought, Carl Sagan even uh, couldn't help himself and uh, in indulged in similar speculations, um, thinking that the dinosaurs might have uh, become intelligent, uh, writing and reading books uh, had the comet not hit. Um, and here's an illustration of this um, rather strange um, presumption, preoccupation. Uh, however, um, to begin to wrap this all to a close, um, the question of the cosmic inevitability of technological intelligence had actually already begun to be put to the test since the early 1960s. Um, that is in the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, SETI, um, radio antenna had started scouring uh, for aliens in the Milky Way and had found nothing but silence. Uh, moreover, an alien intelligence had been discovered on our own planet, the dolphin. Um, and it had become clear through this discovery that dolphins are in fact highly intelligent, um, which, was a discovery of the 1960s, um, it became clear through this that there is nothing inevitable about big brained animals um, developing advanced technology. Um, and this made suddenly this discovery that dolphins are highly intelligent, they just haven't uh, been compelled to develop telescopes or atom bombs. This made our own form of intelligence just suddenly seem so much more cosmically contingent and fragile. People went on to romanticize the dolphin. Uh, here's Isley again saying that the dolphin is an almost disembodied intelligence floating in the wavering green fairyland of the sea, an intelligence possibly near or comparable to our own, but without hands to build, to trans transmit knowledge by writing, to alter by one highest breath the planet's surface or poison with strontium the planetary winds. If man had sacrificed his hands for flukes, the moral might run, he would still be a philosopher but there would have been taken from him the devastating power to wreak his thought upon the body of the world. Now, this is, uh, you know, 
Eisley is a beautiful writer, but this is just pure romanticism, this idea that um, somehow dolphins are just as philosophical as us, they just haven't got technology. Uh, this is just a modern form of the prelapsarian uh, myth of uh, Adam and Eve in Eden. Because technology is not an optional qualifier of the human, uh, it is technology that in fact made us philosophical. Um, if it wasn't for the surpluses of food and energy uh, bequeathed by technology, we wouldn't have the time uh, or the comfort or the energy to sit around and think and ponder. So our ability for truly consequential altruism and for poisoning the planetary winds have the same root. We wouldn't have one without the other. It is an entirely contingent endowment, um, seemingly cosmically so, and backed up by the evidence of the fact that there are other intelligences on Earth, other highly advanced intelligences, cephalopods and cetaceans, but none of them are technological. Um, so it is entirely up to us what we make of this cosmically contingent endowment. Um, so yeah, the prelapsarian path of the porpoise is close to us. Uh, why not? One cannot be philosophical without being technological. So if uh, humanity killed itself, would this technological intelligence evolve again? By the 1960s, and given this discovery of our fellow intelligences in the dolphins and this revelation that there's nothing inevitable seemingly in the bipedal technological humanoid, people had finally arrived at a, um, a full picture regarding our contingents. William W. Howells uh, wrote this in 1960. What about the chances of humans coming into existence again, not elsewhere, but on this very planet? Supposing in a moment of idiot progress, we really killed ourselves off. Would Homo rise again? Our hopes for repetition are not good, so we had better stay the hand that drops the bomb. And so finally, by the 70s and 80s, uh, a new appreciation of um, our uniqueness as a product of a unique planetary history, unlikely to be repeated or occur elsewhere, or to have already happened elsewhere, uh, was falling into place. Um, here's a quote from Jacques Monod, the French biochemist from 1970. And he sums this up very nicely, I think. He says, at the source of these errors, of course, is the anthropocentric illusion. The heliocentric theory, the concept of inertia, and the principle of objectivity were never enough to dissipate that ancient mirage. Far from dispelling the illusion, the theory of evolution at first seemed to endow it with a new reality by making man no longer the center of the entire universe, but its natural heir, awaited from time immemorial. It was not until the second half of this century that this new anthropocentric illusion, propped on the theory of evolution, collapsed in its turn. My thesis is that the biosphere does not contain a predictable class of ob objects or of events, but is itself a particular event, Certainly compatible indeed with first principles, but not deducible from those principles and therefore essentially unpredictable. Here's a similar quote from Stephen Jay Gould from uh, 1989. And he talks of replaying the tape of life. So beginning the story of evolution uh, from, its, from its opening and replaying it and seeing if the same results happen again and again. And he came down very hard on the conclusion that the results would be very different each time. He writes, run the tape again and let the tiny twig of Homo sapiens expire in Africa. Run the tape again, and this time Neanderthal perishes in Europe and Homo erectus in Asia, as they did in our world. The sole surviving human stock, Homo erectus in Africa, stumbles along a while, even prospers, but does not speciate and therefore remains stable. A mutated virus then wipes Homo erectus out or a change in climate reconverts Africa into inhospitable forest. One little twig on the mammalian branch, a lineage with interesting possibilities that were never realized, joins the vast majority of species in extinction. So what? Most possibilities are never realized, and who will ever know the difference? Arguments of this form lead me to the conclusion that biology's most profound insight into human nature, status, and potential lies in the simple phrase, the embodiment of contingency. Homo sapiens is an entity, not a tendency. Okay, so just to conclude, um, I want to run through some of the basic insights that I've been trying to cover here. So throughout history, it seems that um, there's a direction of travel in our discoveries and 
these insights flow from that. Uh, first, we and our fellow life forms appear to be the product of a unique and contingent history, one that won't repeat here or elsewhere. There is nothing inevitable about humanoids or our peculiar, peculiar, precarious technological form of intelligence. With that form of intelligence comes philosophy alongside the, the ability to both improve the world and to poison it. And since the 1950s and hydrogen bombs, that technological ability has become potent enough to poison the biosphere irre irreversibly, perhaps even to kill it. The future for life on Earth could be huge or it could end tomorrow based upon our ignorance and folly here and now. Moreover, it seems like we could represent the first and only foothold for life and mind within an otherwise silent and inorganic cosmos. Perhaps then we represent the first seed or catalyst that will tip the wider abiotic cosmos into a richer, more complex, more diverse biotic state. But this is just a potential um, and it is up to us what we do with that potential whether we squander it now or become worthy of our astronomically unlikely endowment. Um, and so final slide, just to close, uh, I want to read this quote from the Soviet astronomer, uh, Joseph Shklovsky from 1977. He wrote, our loneliness in the universe is of great moral and ethical significance for humanity. The value of our technological and especially humanistic achievements is growing immeasurably. The knowledge that we are, as it were, the vanguard of matter, if not in all of the universe, but a giant part of it, should be a powerful stimulus for the creative activity of each individual and all humanity. The responsibility of mankind is growing to an enormous extent in connection with the exclusivity of the tasks facing it. The inadmissibility of regressive social institutions, senseless and barbaric wars, and self-destructive potential is becoming extremely clear. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. That was extremely stimulating. Um, I would start by asking if there are any questions from the audience. Yeah, hi. Thanks, Thomas. Um, my, I was, had a question um, about your latest book in which you state that the apocalypse and extinction are two critically different ideas. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, thanks. That's a, that's a good question. Um, so um, often when I talk about the fact that I've written on the history of the idea of human extinction, um, people say, okay, what type of history are you doing? And I say, I think it's an idea that was discovered. It's not an idea that was always known. And it's then at that point that um, there's often someone who kind of raises their eyebrow and goes, um, uh, when was it discovered? And I say, oh, it's rather mo modern invention, um, uh, you know, past few centuries, maybe even. And then they go, well, have you read uh, the book of Revelation? Have you heard of, um, you know, Buddhist eschatology? Have you heard of end of the world in XYZ religion. Um, now, yeah, people have been talking and thinking and writing and telling stories about the end of the world, uh, the end of humanity, um, since people could talk and tell stories. Um, however, in uh, the religious and, um, uh, you know, spiritual traditions, um, what we recognize as apocalypses is very different from um, what I think we're talking about now when we talk about human extinction. Um, and so in the book, I, I try and, you know, cram this, th these ideas down into one sentence by saying that, um, uh, whereas apocalypse occurs, a sense of an ending extinction, uh, anticipates the ending of sense. Now to unpack that, um, basically in apocalypse, um, particularly in, again, the Abrahamic um, traditions in apocalypse, uh, what apocalypse is, is the culmination of the moral order. Um, so that might be inscrutable to us as mere mortals, but in some sense, it's the end uh, that the whole universe has been drawing towards. It's the revelation of the moral order throughout. So think of judgment day, it's the sorting of the good and the bad. 
it's the ultimate dictate, the ultimate decree. So it's in a sense, um, yeah, the culmination. Whereas in Extinction, what we're thinking about is that um, that in some sense is, uh, it's not the culmination of moral agency in the world. It's in some sense, uh, it's termination insofar as we recognize ourselves as um, potentially the only moral agents. Um, so that doesn't mean that animals aren't. Animals are moral patients in the sense that they um, are beneficiaries, they can suffer um, uh, and we should care about them a lot. But we seem to be one of the only species that cares a lot about morality in the sense of pushing the universe into more um, just or um, quote unquote better um, configurations. Now, obviously, that that faculty of ours is massively um, uh, fallible. Um, I'm not saying, you know, I'm not being kind of one of those uh, 18th century Enlightenment progressivist optimists and saying that we're always good at that. But at least we have the potential. Um, so yeah, um, so so that's one thing is that um, extinction seems to be um, not the culmination of morality. It seems to be its opposite. It seems to be the frustration of what we might recognize as a moral order. But just more simply, um, uh, in most um, religious traditions, spiritual traditions, um, there just simply isn't a um, recognition that the wider physical universe could go on existing without us uh, around um, kind of wandering, you know, meandering aimlessly, uh, physically, um, without our aspirations, uh, desires and designs. In most of those traditions, um, the end of humanity is coeval exactly with the end of the whole universe. Um, so you find that in, yeah, plenty of the traditions. So this, I, it's, it's a, I think it's a really modern scientific idea, the discovery that, you know, this vast universe will kind of continue without us and it's not interested in our fate in that way. Um, so I, yeah, I hope that, um, I hope that uh, explores that distinction a little bit. Yeah, it does. And I was interested to hear you say at the end that you consider this to be a modern um, sort of the idea of extinction to be a modern development and, just based on your talk, you also seem to see it as like an entirely Western European way of thinking. Um, and I wonder if it might be useful for you to think more about, um, you know, I'm sure you get this question all the time because it does seem to be like a major restriction in your research. Um, if we're talking about ideas of like cyclical time, non-morally rooted apocalypse, I mean, the examples of these are multifarious outside of the Western world. Um, so yeah, I'd be interested to hear why you've placed that kind of restriction on your thought and your research. Mm, yeah, yeah. So it's mainly a restriction based on um, uh, my own uh well, like, you know, my own kind of comfort is that, you know, having, um, uh, I mean, comfort in the sense that I can, read, you know, English and European languages and less so others. Um, so that's the restriction. Um, I'm hoping to rectify that moving forwards. Um, so for my writings moving forwards, um, I'm really hoping to open this up and, um, uh, begin uh, digging through the other non-Western traditions to see how much this similar, um, uh, how much a similar kind of movement or a similar um, development might apply or might not apply. Um, uh, so, you know, for example, I know that um, uh, that, say, for example, um, uh, the Indian tradition is very comfortable um, from much further back with vast periods of time that are not just like uh, meaninglessly infinite in that kind of sense that I was pointing out in the ancient Greeks, but are kind of mensurable, but also enormous. Um, so I know that in other traditions, there is like a real sense of deep time that it seems that it took the West a lot longer to arrive at and become comfortable with. Um, so I'm sure that there's uh, tons of, you know, um, interesting stuff to be found. And I, I, I'm just now embarking on um, trying to rectify the really Western centric aspect of my work so far uh, and moving forwards, I, I really want to, yeah, improve on that and make, um, make this more of a global story rather than, um, cause at the moment, as you're right to say, it is very much a, a Euro centric and European focused one. Um, 
so yeah i mean it's hard because um it's it's hard because of uh, you know translation and also secondary literature but um that's no excuse so <laughs> moving forward i'm yeah i'm i'm hoping to um rectify that particularly i'm particularly interested actually in looking at uh, models of time in uh, philosophy um and uh, history in china because there's this kind of uh very simplistic idea if you go back and look at history of ideas writing from say like the 1950s um and before there's this idea that like all of all notions in uh china um have always been deeply cyclical um and i just get the hunch that that's probably completely wrong um or the picture is far more complex and um some of the stuff that i've been reading just to begin this new kind of um uh new sense of opening up my project um implies that yeah that that is true is that um the picture is way more complicated so i'm i'm really keen and excited to get to grips with all of that um because yeah i mean it's like if someone said oh the history you know models of time in the west are dominated by the you know zoroastrian or abrahamic idea of linear time that's just wrong you know it's it's always this complicated and multifarious picture so yeah it's exciting um to get to grips with how that plays out in the different traditions as well so yeah thank you it's a brilliant question and i totally agree i i um yeah, I need to um, open this out. And that's what I'm hoping to do next. So yeah, thank you. I mean, if, if anyone has any suggestions of places that might be useful to look, I, I would be really keen to hear. Hi, I do have a question that may be a bit more kind of like personal, like regarding your own definition of uh, existential risk and uh and what you think uh is the most urgent existential risk that humanity is facing today um so definition of existential risk um uh so i do like the idea of um it be so you know there's a sense in which um there's a sense in which all extinction events might see might be existential risks uh but not the other way around um and so i yeah i do like the definitions of it based in uh preserving options for future people so there are some that are based in this idea that and i like this because from studying history of ideas i get this very strong sense that we have absolutely well basically a very strong sense of epistemic humility we have no idea really what the full picture is now because people even say you know a few a handful of generations ago were missing some of the you know the the most important um aspects of this wider picture and some of the biggest priorities so there's no way that we suddenly now have the entire picture um and so because of that i like this idea of focusing on conserving and preserving um options for future generations so what we should be focusing on now is uh not doing things now which indelibly mar humanity's record um so this is kind of moving away from existential risk but just thinking about what we owe the future in some wider sense so um trying to avoid atrocities that would indelibly mar our record um, but also trying to avoid things that would close off uh you know avenues of exploration that the future could explore or might want to explore so i think yeah it's about a sense of uh, what we have the power now to do things that might um you know ir irreversibly destroy options for future people um and i think that since it's safe to assume that they will probably know more than us um i think we should just be kind of trying to preserve their ability to um uh, be able to explore those options and um there's no rush to like you know achieve all potential now or anything like that we should be kind of patiently just allowing future people to explore it should they want to um so uh, yeah i'm not sure if that i'm not sure if that fully answers your question but um uh, yeah i'm not sure if that having like a hard definition of this is a good thing because our ideas about these questions of existential risk or whatever they're developing quite quickly so um i think it's yeah that's the that's the thing that i like to focus on Thank you. Yes, it does. Yeah. Thank you. Well, great. Um, thank you, Thomas. I think our time is coming to an end. 
Um, so I just wanted to thank you for your time and for your lecture. And um, yeah, thank you for being here virtually. And um, thanks for everyone. Bye, Thomas. Thank you so much. Thanks uh, for the questions. They're fantastic. And uh, yeah, thank you for organizing. It's been a pleasure to take part in this. Have a lovely afternoon. Bye bye. You too. Thank you. Bye.